So, I have a little lecture here on how to calculate some basic probabilities. So, for those of you in my class, this will relate to chapter 12. So, first off, how do we find the probability of one, and maybe later, more things happening? And those things that are happening, we are going to give the term event. And there are some that we already know. So, here's our first example. If we flip a coin and the event is getting heads, this is how we would write that notation. The probability of the event happening, so in this specific case it would be the probability of getting heads, and what is that? So if you flip a coin, what's the probability that you get heads? Right, and I know everybody's going to say one half, or maybe you'd say um, 50%, right, or maybe you'd say 0.5. Okay, you can t say any one of those things, and they will be just fine. Okay, let's do another one that you're going to know. Let's roll a die as the experiment, and the event that we're interested in is getting a 3. So what's the pro here's our notation, the probability kind of looks like function notation, if you know what that means, if you don't, don't worry. P, probability, 3, the thing we're interested in, in parentheses right after it. What's the probability of getting a 3? So, right, one-sixth. And if you're not sure, you could write out the sample space, everything you could possibly get when you roll a die, and, and count how many threes there are. Okay, same experiment, experiment. So we're rolling a die again. This time, what's the probability we get a seven? Notice we're only rolling one die. What's the probability we get a seven? That's, yeah, exactly, zero. No chance we're going to get a seven, because that's not on a standard die. Okay, oh gosh, okay, here we go. Let's roll two dice this time. And now the event is sum of seven. So let's think about how we would write that with our new notation. So what's the, I'll write it down here, what's the probability that we get a sum of seven when we roll two die? Now I'm not going to write it all out because I'll get bored and so will you. Well. I need to have a little table, and thankfully, I made one of these up earlier, and you can make your own. Scoot in, make sure everybody can be seen. So here's just a little table that shows the two different die being rolled and the sum. Okay. So what's the probability that when I do this, I'm going to have a the sum of seven come up? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six ways that that could happen out of all the different possibilities. So what did I say, six ways out of the 36 possible outcomes. Okay. And then of course, you'd reduce that to one sixth. Great. So let's go and generalize here. The probability of the event occurring the way we can find that is the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of outcomes. Okay. And symbolically, what that's going to look like? The probability of E equals the number of E, number of favorable outcomes, remember N stands for number, divided by the number in the sample space. So S is standing for the sample space. Great. And then, just some general information. Probabilities are always between 0 and 1. So that you might be thinking about that 50% I had out here, but it was a percent, right? So that really means 50 out of 100. Probabilities are always between 0 and 1. Notice it's um, greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1. So that if the probability of something happening is 0. If the probability is 0, that means the event so E is impossible, and if the probability of E equals 1, then E is um, guaranteed. Okay, all right. So the next thing that can happen
is maybe we're going to have some compound events to calculate here. So let's take a look. Compound, just like in English, right, compound sentences are combined with or, not, and and. And we're going to do the same thing here, but I'm not going to say a whole lot about not because it's just like you've been doing with complements from other chapters. So here's our first example. Let's see if we can figure it out without the formula first. So let's roll two dice, and our event is getting a sum of 7 or 11. Okay? So let's get my little table back here. So this time, the two things that will work for us are getting a 7 or getting an 11. Well, how many different ways is that going to happen? So notation for probability, probability 7 or 11. Well, how many ways can I get 7? Um, 1, 2, 3, 6, right? And 11 would work as well. I have two more of those, so 6 plus 2 is 8. So eight ways to be successful that time over the 36 possible outcomes that were still available to us. Okay. So one thing that happens when you combine events with or is we start talking about are the events mutually exclusive? So mutually exclusive, right? it's kind of like a vocabulary word for math. Two events, A and B, are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur simultaneously. So if I roll two dice, I couldn't get a sum of 7 and a sum of 11 at the same time. Right? There's only one thing that's going to be happening there, 7 or 11 or something else. Okay. So that brings us to our first property, the addition property. If A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A or B, 7 or 11, equals the probability of A plus the probability of B. So let's see, let's make sure that works for that example we just did. So probability 7 or 11 should be the probability of 7 plus the probability of 11. So from our well, I can't bring the table up, so you guys know the table. Probability of 7 is 6 out of 36. I'm not going to reduce it because I need that 36 here in a second. The probability of 11, go count how many 11s you have on your chart. It's going to be out of 36. I see 2 on my chart. And this says that I get to add those together. So if I add two fractions with the same denominator, Right, what do we do? We add the numerators, carry along the denominator. So 6 plus 2 is 8 over 36. Fabulous. Same answer we got before. All right. Well, not everything is going to be mutually exclusive. So let's do an example of events that are not mutually exclusive. So this time our experiment is going to deal with a deck of cards. So uh, if you're not familiar with cards, you might want to grab a deck and just see what kind of um, sets you can find in there. there red ones, black ones, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. Okay. So we'll draw a card, and the event that we're interested in is getting a red card or getting a four. So let's think about, I'm going to slide the paper, oh, you can still see it right here, mutually exclusive. A and B, red or four, are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur simultaneously. Well, if you're looking at your deck of cards, we can absolutely have these two things happen at the same time, right? We could have a four and a red card quite easily. So let's take a look at how we're going to calculate probabilities for compound events that are not mutually exclusive. So since we could have a red four, the outcomes are not mutually exclusive. Here we go. So new addition rule. A and B are not mutually exclusive, then the probability of A or B equals the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Okay. So I'll explain what this A and B represents here in just a second. 
So back to the card experiment. So the probability of red or four. So that would be the probability of red, according to our formula, right? Plus the probability of four minus the probability of a red and a four. Okay. So in our deck of cards, and let's go ahead and just knowing we're going to have fractions over here because probabilities are always between zero and one. Let's do denominators of 52 just so that we can add them easily at the end. So probability of red. How many red cards are there in the deck that has 52 possible outcomes? Uh, well, 26, half of them are red. Plus, probability that we would get a 4 on that draw. Well, 52 is the denominator. And there are four fours in a deck of cards. Okay, four of each denomination minus out of the 52 cards, how many are red and four? Well, there are two red fours, right? There's the four of diamonds and the four of hearts, so minus two. So altogether, the probability of getting a red or a four is, what do we have? 26 plus four is 30 minus two is 28. 28 out of 52. Okay, so, so far, I've been talking about theoretical probability. We could also have empirical probability. So we're going to use the same for formulas as we've been using for theoretical probability. But we get to get our values for the number of favorable outcomes and the number of your samples, or yeah, sample set base from a table. So here's an example that I just made up off the top of my head. So let's say that this is a stem and leaf plot. Oh, so now I get to talk about stem and leaf plots very quickly here. Stem and leaf plot for a class's test scores. So stem and leaf, so these are the stems, and these represent 90s, 80s, 70s, and 60s. And over here I do the leaves. So you can see from this that I have a 90, one person earned a 93, one person got a 92, a 98 an 84, an 85, a 70, a 62, and so forth, okay? So from this, so let's count, let's first of all see what N of S is. How many are in my sample space? So I don't have to count my stems, right, because they're all, they're just giving me the, um, the actual numbers, but I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I have 15 students in that class, it looks like. And now we have to decide what our experiment might be. So let's say, what's the probability if I grab a student's test at random, what's the probability that it's um, a B? So that would mean in the 80s. What's the probability that the test I chose is in the 80s? Well, so now I need to know the number of tests in the 80s and divide that with the number in the sample space. Well, the number in the sample space we counted, that was 15. So now how many 80s do I have? Well, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. So let's, I've got a piece of paper here. Let's expand that just a little bit. So what if I instead ask, what's the probability that the test I grab has a score less than 80. Okay, so now I'm not just looking for one particular group, but I'm kind of like grouping them together. So it could be in the 70s or the 60s or, or anything below that. So I still have my 15 denominator, but now I have to figure out which, which elements in my sample space are less than 80. So let's see, I wouldn't count 80 because it says less than, not less than or equal to. So I have one, two, three, four, five. I have five that are less than 80. Okay. Oh, we could do the or thing. Okay, I think I can still fit this on here. Let's scoot it up here. What's the probability that I choose an A test or a B test? Would those be mutually exclusive? 
Well, I'm going to do a very um, general description and have all the A's be in the 90s and all the B's be in the 80s, and we'll not talk about pluses and minuses. Mutually exclusive, right? So it's either an A or a B. It can't be both at the same time. So I need the probability of getting an A plus the probability of getting a B, and I don't have anything to subtract off because right there's nothing in common. So the probability of getting an A, I'm going to talk slowly so you can write it down. You know what the denominator is. How many A's? Probability of B, we had that from above, so I'll just grab that 7 fifteenths and bring it down. And all together, 10 fifteenths. A couple of things to note. Back in the red 4 and now in this A or B, Right, we're doing quite a few calculations before we get to our final answer. But note, our final answer right here is still a number, right, between 0 and 1. Right? If somehow you come up with a probability that is 1.5, it's like, oh, but I did all my calculations and I have 1.5, you should have some big old red flag going off in your brain saying, Oh, wait a second, though. Probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. I must have done something incorrectly. Let's go find that. All right, on to the next one. So let's see, we're done with that page. And we're done with this page. And we're going to slide this guy down. So now let's do a compound event with and. So and. So if our experiment, this time we're going to do two things at once. We're going to roll a die and flip a coin. What's the probability, what do you guys think that means? What's the probability I get tails and a two? And so I've got a, a die and I've got a coin that I'm going to flip. What's the probability that when I look down I see tails and I see a two? Well, we have options for calculating that. So let's look at some of those options and decide which one we want to use. We could write out the sample space. I don't think that would be that hard, right? Do you remember, I'd probably do a tree diagram for that. Should we do that very quickly? I don't think I'll end up going with that one all the way, but the sample space for um, rolling a die and flipping a coin. Uh-oh, looks like my pen's about to die. New pen. So. If I roll the die, right, I could get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 coming out. And then the tree diagram, off of each of these, we branch and do the coins. So tails, heads, tails, heads. I don't know why I started with tails, but I did. Tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads. I heard labor do tree diagrams because this always happens. I always get scrunched. Okay. So how many are in my sample space? Do you remember how we figure that out then? Count up how many are along this outer thing, and that tells me how what my n of s is. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. And then how many are tails and 2? Tails and 2, that's that guy right there. And how do we make a probability again? Right, it's that ratio, n of e over n of s, so 1, 12. Okay, so that's how we do it with our samples, writing out the sample space. Okay, oh, maybe we want to use the fundamental counting principle. Maybe you loved counting chapters so much, you want to go ahead and show off your skills there. So let me bring in a new piece of paper. Fundamental counting principles. So that's going to, this fundamental counting principle will t give us, right, the number in our sample space. So how many ways can I, have an outcome on the die, right, 6. And how many things can happen with the coin? 2. 
6 times 2 is 12, so this gives me the n of s. Okay. And then I guess we'd need a, another way to come up with the 1 for the numerator. So n of e, maybe we'd just have to convince ourselves that that was 1. And then again, make that ratio. I'm doing the same problem three different times, so you guys can see that you have choices. Okay. So option 3, use the multiplication property for probability. So let's see what that one looks like. Probability of A and B equals the probability of A times, oh gosh, there's something totally new. The probability of B given, that's what we're going to, when we see this little line here, vertical. So um, in some of your math classes, when you get to that, you say such that. In probability, when we see that, we say the word given. So the probability of A and B happening equals the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. Okay. So if A and B are independent, which we'll talk about in a second, the probability of A, or probability of B given A, is the same thing as the probability of B. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let me find my right piece of paper here. Hold on. Stay with me. <coughs> so, we're going to have to come back and fill in this multiplication property for probability because first we're going to take a little sidestep into conditional probability. Let's talk about that probability of B given A. So probability of B given A. Okay. So here's our experiment. We're going to draw a card. What's the probability that we get hearts given we have a red card? So what you want to think is, okay, I already know it's red, right? They told me it's red. What's the probability that it's a heart? So what you want to think of within a deck of cards, right? In the red, in the red cards, right? Half of them are hearts and half of them are diamonds. So the probability that it's a heart given it's red, right, would be one half. Because half, right, half of the red cards are hearts. So let's do one more experiment here. Let's do the, let's roll a die. And let's look at, oh gosh, okay, because it's math class. Let's see what we can do. What's the probability we roll a prime given it's an odd number. So now we know it's, so let's write down our sample space because sometimes I have a hard time seeing this. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So I know it's odd. So now the only ones I have to choose from are um, one, three, five. I know it's odd. It's one of these guys. What's the probability that it's prime? So Oh gosh, that's going to be tricky. I know you're going to want to say that one. Maybe not, because people, somebody probably beat that into you way back when. So the three and the five are the prime ones. One is actually not a prime number. So the probability that it's prime, given that it's odd, would be out of these. So this time my denominator, right, this is my new sample space, one, three, five. I knew it was odd. So the things I get to choose from is restricted down to these three numbers, and two of those are prime numbers. Okay, okay let's do one more. Oh, let's do that same one, but let's kind of flip it around. What's the probability it's odd given that it's prime? So let's, I'm looking at my list there, how many of those are prime numbers? So this set of primes out of my one through six are... Um, let's see, 2 is a prime number, 3, 4 is not, 5 is. Oh, it's 3 again. Okay. 
So now I have three. The fact that these are going to be the same number is just a coincidence. Um, so three numbers to choose from. And how many of those are odd? Uh, three and five. Two. OK. So what were we working on? Oh. So back to this multiplication property. Probability of t and 2, right, is equal to the probability of t times the probability of 2, given that we had tails happen before. Okay. Well, what's the probability that I get tails if I flip a, a coin? One half. Now, f flipping a coin and rolling a die are mutually exclusive. I'm sorry, are independent. So the fact that I have tails here doesn't affect what's going to happen on the die. So it's if they're independent, then the probability of B given A is the same thing as the probability of B. So I just really need the probability of getting a 2 for this part right here. So probability of tails times the probability of 2. 1 half times 1 sixth is 1 twelfth. All right. Here we go. Let's find my next piece of paper here. I think we've done all of these. So let's do an example where A and B are dependent. So you can kind of see what that looks like. So when we say dependent, what we mean is A's occurring affect the probability of B happening. Okay. So the, the sheet that I had up there just a second ago, let me find it, right here, right? It was just one thing. We were just interested in that, that first thing happening, and we already had the given. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of step back just a little bit. So this time, I've got a bag of jelly beans, okay, a jar of jelly beans, it looks like. And the experiment, the first experiment we'll do is we're going to choose two jelly beans and we're going to eat them, okay? So the event is, right, picking an orange one first and then a blue jelly bean. So putting it into symbols. So a lot of the books use these same symbols. What's the probability of orange first and B second? So using our multiplication property, the probability of getting an, o, an orange one first times the probability of getting a blue one second given we had an orange one first. So let's see. What's the probability of getting an orange one first? So remember, it's going to be a fraction. So I need to know the total number of jelly beans in here. So there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 jelly, I thought there were 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh, I want 12 jelly beans. Okay, we'll have a jack, black jelly bean. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now we have 12. 12 is just a nicer denominator. Okay, so 12 on the bottom. And how many of those are orange? 1, 2, 3, 4. Four orange ones. Okay. So everybody's good with that. I know you guys are fine. But now let's think about it. I just grabbed an orange jelly bean and popped it in my mouth. Okay, so one of these orange jelly beans is gone. I'll put my finger over it. I can't get my finger over one of them. Maybe right there. Okay. So now, what's the probability that I get a blue jelly bean given the orange one's gone? Well, how many jelly beans are left in there? Exactly. Eleven, right? One of them's in my mouth. And how many of the ones that are left are blue? Let's see, I have one, two, I have three blue ones left, so three. And that, if we multiply those together, which I'm going to do by reducing just so that I can do it. Um, three, four, oh, ones. So it looks like one-eleventh. There's a, the probability is one-eleventh that we'll get an orange one first and then a blue one. Okay, 
So the other take on this same experiment that can be confusing, oh gosh, and the jelly beans are, oh, oh, try to keep all the jelly beans there and see the bottom, and it's tough, I know, squint. So here's my jelly beans. What's, so now we're going to choose two jelly beans, but I'm trying to get that black one, right? So I'm going to pick out one, put it back, and pick another one. What's the probability that Instead of getting the black one, what's the probability that both of them I chose are orange? So what's the probability the first one is orange? Well, that was four twelfths, right? And then I put it back in the jelly bean jar. So what's the probability the next one is orange? Well, there's still 12 jelly beans in there, and there's still four orange ones. So it's this product here, right? It didn't go down. So if we reduce that, what, one-third times one-third, so one-ninth. All right, I just have a couple more pages here to go through. So sometimes, for this conditional probability, um, so I know your, your probability book, your statistics book, whatever class you're going to do, they've got a bunch of formulas written. They have a formula written for the conditional probability and the and, and it has a, a big fraction in it. So not only the little fractions we're making as we go, but a big fraction for um, comparing those two ratios. Oh my gosh, it's never that hard. The formula, I think, makes it so much tougher. So let's do it with this table because we have one, or sometimes we can make one. So here it is. Um, so let's say I have a group of employees. Some of them are full-time, some of them are part-time. Um, and then the males and females. So the fact that I have sixes and tens in both places is just coincidence. Okay, So they don't have to be the same numbers here and here, it just happened. They do all have to add up to that same total of six, 16 employees altogether. Okay. So let's see. Let's go through how many of these can I scoot on to here. I can get most of them. I have one more down here at the bottom. I'll scroll to get in a second. So Let's choose an employee at random. What's the probability that that employee is female? So again, it's, it's our same thing, the number of females over the number in your sample space, right, which is our employees. So how many females are there all together? Well, there are 10. No, this isn't conditional. This is just showing you how to get this out of a table. And the total number of employees, 16. Okay. And then you reduce. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to. So now let's do this next one. What's the probability that we choose a female given it's a full-time employee? Now here's how we can use the table. I know I have a full-time employee, so I know I'm in this column here. I can ignore everything else and just think about this first column. So I know I have a full-time employee, so altogether I had six, right, six employees that it could be, and four of those are female. Okay. So that thing that comes after the given is puts you in the column or row that you need to be in. So this next one, what's the probability, so I'm picking an employee, probability I choose a part-time employee given it's a male. So now I know it's a male employee, so now I know I'm in this row right there. So my denominator is six, I have six male employees, and of those, four are part-time. All right, and let's do one with and. Let me show you, oh gosh, oh, okay, so, I'm, so this was full-time. And this is part-time, just so that I can, I think I can keep everything kind of on the screen. So here's our conditional. Probability of full-time and male. Now we could do the chart, or we could do our, our um, formula. Uh, P of full-time times probability male, given the employee is full-time. But it's not that hard. It's so much easier than that. Full-time and male. Altogether, I have 16 employees to choose from. And how many of those are full-time and male? Um, just those two. Slide two. 
Now if you do this formula, you're going to get the same ratio, right? But if you have the table, you don't have to go through this formula here. You can just look and pick off who, who works here, full-time and male. There are only two people who make that all happen. Okay. Okay, last page. Best for last. So, sometimes we're going to need to use our counting techniques. So let's do one quick example here. So let's, um, let's say we have a choral group. So we have a chorus and there are eight girls and four boys. And we need to choose a group of three to perform. So let's just say the probability I'm interested in. What's the probability they're all girls? So here are some options. So the counting technique how many different ways can I choose a group of three, choose a group of three out of the 12, right? Order doesn't matter. So 12 choose three. And then, right, so this is how many total groups of three I can have. How many of those are going to be all girls? Well, how many ways out of the eight can I choose three? Right? Okay, so let me grab my calculator and do that. And I know you guys are doing the same thing. So um, 8 choose 3 is 56. And 12 choose 3 is 220. And I did the calculation just so that I could compare. So 0.2545 repeating. Because I wanted to show you that it's the same that we get if we do. Well, that they're all three. What's the probability that the first is a girl and the second is a girl and the third is a girl? Okay. Well, what's the probability that the first the first student we pick is a girl? Right. So the probability that the first Oh, I have to guess I have to write it. So probability that the first is a girl times the probability that the second is a girl given the first is a girl. That was a G. Right? Times the probability that the third is a girl given the first and second are girls. Okay, here we go. Probability that the first one is a girl. Well, there are eight girls and 12 students. Okay. So now, what's the probability the second one we pick is a girl, given the first is a girl? So now I only have 11 students to choose from, right, because one of them is already in the van. And of those 11 remaining, only seven are girls, because the one in the van is a girl. So I no longer have eight girls to choose from, just seven. And then likewise, is probability the third is a girl, given that the first and second are girls? So I only have six more girls left and only ten more students altogether. Okay. And if you do all of the reducing and make all of that look nice, um, you come out or can come out with that same 56 over 220. So it doesn't really matter which one of those ways you go with. You're going to find one that makes sense, and, and maybe you're going to switch around a little bit because different times, different ones feel better.